Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this installment of the Talent Lab Impact Series, which is a program of FIU in Washington, DC. We're doing this one in collaboration with FIU's Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean Center. I'm Eric Feldman, Associate Director of FIU in DC, reporting live from the nation's capital this morning for our migration briefing focused on Latin America. If you are new to uh, FIU and DC programs or need a refresher, FIU is uh, in DC is the university's presence here in Washington. And this particular event is a great example of all three pillars of our work. Our solutions work is engaging directly with congressional offices and federal agencies on FIU's uh, priorities, which certainly includes Latin America policy and even immigration policy as it affects our students. If there's ever any legislation moving around um, DACA students or temporary protected status or financial aid for students, you know, we're going to be engaging with the federal government to make sure that uh, we advocate for our students on that particular topic. Idea exchange is when we bring together not only FIU experts like we have on this panel, but uh, experts from across other universities, think tanks, uh, and the federal government, which we certainly see in this panel uh, today. And I look forward to introducing all of the panelists and also uh, the Talent Lab. The Talent Lab is the part of our operation that I manage. This is our student success operation. A little bit more about the Talent Lab. Uh, this summer marks 10 years of FIU and DC supporting FIU students as they intern in Washington and one year of anniversary of our Hamilton Scholars Program, our VIP DC internship semester program. Uh, it's gone great in a hybrid fashion over the past year, and we look forward to our first in-person cohort this fall. Uh, some of the candidates for that program um, are joined us uh, today. We also have a digital badge to train students to be DC ready for DC internships and fly in seminars. Um, after I introduce everyone, I'll paste some links into the chat so you can learn more about FIU and DC and subscribe to our newsletter and reach out to me um, as needed. If you like this event and want to experience something similar with a more uh, technological focus, uh, you can register for our next event, which is focused on blockchain and cryptocurrency, uh, its role in financial literacy and how you can connect to careers in that industry. It's co-hosted with our friends at the Blockchain Association based here in DC. Uh, we'll paste the link for the chat as well uh, for that. Hope to see you there. So now it'll be my pleasure to introduce uh, today's uh, panelists and moderator, and then I will uh, turn it over to the moderator uh, and get out of the way of a fantastic conversation. Uh, as a professor, diplomat, and politician, Luis Guillermo Solis Rivera served as the 47th president of Costa Rica from 2014 through 2018 prior to his election. He was a full professor, researcher, and director of the Central American Master's Program in Political Science and deputy director of the School of Political Science and associate dean of social sciences at the University of Costa Rica. He also worked at the Costa Rica Ministry of Foreign Affairs as chief of staff to the minister and later as ambassador at large for Central American Affairs and director for Ge general for policy between 20. 2009 and 2012, he was representative of the Ibero-American General Secretariat for Central America and Haiti. In 2016, he was appointed co-chair of the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on the economic empowerment of women. Solis is a graduate of the University of Costa Rica and has a master's degree in history and political science from Tulane University. With 30 years as an educator, he has also taught in universities throughout the US and Europe and in 1999 was a Fulbright Scholar here at FIU. Eric Olson oversees the Seattle International Foundation's engagement with the DC-based policy community and provides strategic policy advice to the Foundation's Central American partners on priority issue areas such as promoting the rule of law and the governance, ending forced migration and displacement, ensuring equity and strengthening civil society, he oversees the foundation's anti-impunity project and independent journalism fund. He also um, served as the Wilson Center's Mexico Institute and Latin American programs deputy directors for 11 years and uh, remains a global fellow there. He has published numerous articles and books, including Crime and Violence in the Northern Triangle, How U.S. Policy is Helping, Hurting, and Can Be Improved, Prior to the Wilson Center, he worked with the Secretary for Political Affairs at the Organization of American States, 
on good governance at Amnesty International USA as Advocacy Director for the Americas and the Washington Office on Latin America, a senior associate from Mexico. Originally from Minnesota, he began his career as a legislative assistant for a member of Congress from that state and has spent over 30 years living and working in Latin America, including Venezuela, where he grew up, Honduras, and Mexico. His master's degree in international affairs is from American University School of International Service here in Washington, DC. And he has a bachelor's degree in education and history from Trinity College in Deerfield, Illinois. Our third panelist, Jessica Cobian, is a senior campaign manager at the Center for American Progress. Prior to that, she was the immigration campaign coordinator at Sojourners, where she advocated for immigrants and refugees through legislative meetings and community actions. Prior to that, she was a lead organizer for the Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment in San Diego, where she worked to uh, develop community leaders from low-income and working families her Bachelor of Arts is in Political Science from the University of California, Riverside, and her Master's of Public Policy is also from American University here, in the nation's capital, Washington, DC. And I'm about to turn it over to our moderator, uh, Rosa Chang. She's an Associate Teaching Professor and the Graduate Program Director in the Department of Criminal Justice and Criminology. I'm a proud graduate of FIU's Criminal Justice Program myself and highly recommend people go check out the Criminal Justice website if you're looking for a graduate degree where Dr. Chang can uh, assist you. She has conferred the degree of PhD in sociology from the University of Miami, that's okay, in June 2009. Her graduate studies were mainly in the area of criminology. She holds a Master of Arts in Sociology from, from UM and her bachelor's in criminal justice from FIU. Prefer, before her appointment at FIU, she held uh, different positions which allowed her to gain experience in teaching, research, and training. She taught in the School of Justice in Miami Dade College. Uh, and the reason that I have invited her to moderate is because her uh, area of academic research focus is on um, the, the criminal perception of, of immigrants, which certainly relates to our topic. And uh, she's a fantastic advocate for getting our students into public service. The way our uh, session will work today, we would love to hear you introduce yourselves in the chat as Dr. Chang gets the conversation rolling. Feel free to let us know your FIU affiliation and most importantly to me, what drew you to this topic today, why you're here, what you want us to know about you. Uh, Dr. Chang will, uh, after asking each of our panelists a question, let you know that it's time to uh, submit your own questions to the chat. You can go ahead and type the question into the chat so we know that that question is pending and we'll call on you, Dr. Chang will call on you to ask that via video so the panelists can hear you directly. One of the links I'm gonna post into the chat before turning it over to Dr. Chang in addition to our talent lab links and uh, I'm gonna post uh, one article by each of our three panelists. They've each re recently written things. So I would like you to have that. And I'm also going to post a, uh, a press release from FIU about some recent research about um, Northern Triangle countries and illicit trade and its influence on migration. And I believe um, that uh, the faculty member, uh, John Zandowitz is here uh, uh, tuned in. And uh, we appreciate that and uh, like to highlight uh, that research. So uh, that's it for me, Dr. Chang, over to you. Hello, good morning. Thank you, Eric, for that introduction. And thank you everyone for making the time and attending, especially uh, thank you the panelists uh, for uh, agreeing to participate in this conversation, which is, I think, uh, very timely uh, and important uh, during these times. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna go ahead and dive in. I've already asked my questions. If everyone can hear me fine, right? Yes, okay, perfect. So our first question for the panel today, it's going to President Solis. So Luis Guillermo, you recently published an editorial on President Biden's plan to address push factors from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. In it, you report that the Biden administration focuses on violence, crime, and unemployment as push factors. Um, and you opine that money alone will not solve the problem that we currently have. Uh, do you agree that these are the primary push factors and what strategies should be pursued in addition to or instead of funding from the United States? Yes, thank you very much, Rosa. Thank you very much, Eric, for inviting me to this uh, excellent opportunity to talk on one of the hemisphere's most pressing issues. 
uh, a humanitarian issue as well as a political and economic issue. I, I thank you very much and I hope that th through this conversation, uh, our students and those who are joining us will have a better understanding of how dire the situation is of these migrants and the need to support their programs. Basically, yes, Rosa, I, I agree with the perspective of the administration. I would call the factors, not push factors, but expelling factors. I think that most migrants are not traveling willingly. They are expelled uh, from their countries by the dire conditions of life that they encounter. And therefore, I think that we have to be very, very uh, clear uh, as to those situations. Other than the, one, the, the, the conditions and the factors that the administration uh, generally propose, I would like to add a number of other things that can be done. Uh, one is to hold the governments accountable. I mean, this is a, the, the situation of migrants is not the responsibility only of the United States. And I, I would go further. I would say it's not even the main, that the United States is the main responsible for what happens to migrants. I mean, the responsibility for whatever is happening to them and the reasons why they're leaving their countries is mainly from the, the governments, the political elites, the economic elites, and the things that they have done or not done uh, throughout the ages. So this is a historical problem that needs to be um, stated, hold governments accountable. And let's remember that Central American migrants are not only coming to the United States, they're also migrating south. There are lots of, of uh, Nicaraguan migrants coming to Costa Rica, my country. There are lots of Colombian migrants going to, to Peru and Vene uh, Venezuelan migrants going to Colombia and to Peru, Bolivians. And so this is a phenomenon that goes beyond the Northern Triangle. Secondly, I think that uh, we should rely or the United States should rely and work with civil society organizations, both uh, Central American or local and foreign. A very uh, extraordinary example of what can be done and achieved uh, is, has just been released yesterday. I, I uh, commend the Seattle Foundation and the Central Americans uh, organizations that have joined with the Seattle Foundation in putting together a coalition precisely to bring together the civil society organizations to counter the perspectives of the official uh, institutions. Three, I would like to suggest that we have to keep the long term in mind. You know, governments, including my own, have four years to work with. Uh, we cannot do things, you know, beyond that unless there is a re-election. But even that is not necessarily certain, as we know. So, we have to, to, to do things in the short term. But in a, in a case such as migrations, uh, that we know is a structure that represents a structural pro pro problem, we have to keep the long term introspective and keep on working with that uh, understanding. Uh, things may not change as fast as one would like. And uh, the last thing that I would like to suggest, that, which is also something that the administration, the Biden administration has, has mentioned, and I am glad that uh, Secretary Majorca has brought it to, 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 to the discussion the other day, is that we have to combat criminal networks. Uh, migrants are there living, coexisting in a context of terrible transnational crime organizations that need to be found, uh, combated, and prosecuted in order for them to uh, be free of this terrible reality, which is uh, responsible for much of their suffering. Okay, thank you very much for your input. So I, um, we are going to hold questions from the audience until the speakers have answered the questions that we have for them, but we'll have plenty of time for students to ask questions. So um, participants, if you do have questions, please jot them down and you can start typing them in the chat as well and we'll get to those, okay? So, um, so our next question is for Eric. Okay, so Eric, in your recent editorial, you and your colleagues framed the situation as a public health crisis, as evidenced by the rates of violence, violent crime and drug use across the Americas including the United States. Uh, tell us more about your take on uh, push factors or as um, President Solis said, expelling factors, okay, that from Central and South America to the United States and the extent to which they are both costs 
by an impact public health across the region and how public health approaches should inform U.S. policy. Well, thank you very much, Professor Chang. I appreciate the opportunity to engage all of you and, and, and thank you to my tokayo, Eric Feldman and President Solis for your leadership and, and, and always a delightful to share uh, the stage with you uh, today. Yes, uh, I, uh, the reference to public health, I think is a very important one. I wanna say clearly, I'm not a public health specialist. Uh, Dr. Fauci has nothing to worry about. Uh, I'm not gonna challenge him for, for leadership on that front. But uh, one thing that we've learned a great deal about uh, is about violence and what compels violence. And I think uh, traditionally policy makers in the United States have treated violence as a secondary issue. Um, the concern has been generally, and I don't wanna overstate it, but generally we have to capture and incarcerate people who consume drugs, people who traffic drugs, people who are engaged in illegal drug activities. And that if violence results from that, well, so be it. A lot of times I've heard politicians, certainly not President Solis, but other politicians say, well, it's just bad guys killing bad guys. It's los criminales están matando entre sí. The criminals are killing themselves. We don't really care. Well, the further we look into the issue of violence, the phenomenon of violence, the more we learn. It isn't inherently true that drug consumption and even drug trafficking is violent. It is at times violent, there's no question. Uh, there are moments of violence. But if you think about it logically, uh, if you're a cocaine producer in Colombia and your market is in New York or Miami or Chicago or LA, uh, you don't want to spend a lot of time and energy shooting up people along the way. You will if you have to, but in, for, in, in reality, most of what they want to do is avoid violence and get to market as quickly as possible because that's how you make money. So we need to step away from the notion that all violence is related to drug trafficking and that all, uh, uh, drug, all, all violence is bad people killing bad people. In fact, we know there are numbers, a whole number of factors contributing to violence. Uh, domestic violence, interfamily violence, violence at the community level, violence of rivalries and of revenge. And so we've begun to study this, and I, I, I'm not saying I'm, I'm the lead in this, I've learned a lot from other people, but to think about violence and the spread of violence as akin to a, a, an epidemic, epi, epidemi, epidemiology, excuse my, my uh, uh, trouble saying that word, but we learned uh, that violence happens often between people who know each other, uh, it reproduces itself, and that it's contagious. Um, and a lot of those ideas and concepts come from the notion of epidemiology and, and it's helped us think how we can break down uh, those uh, networks of violence, social networks, interpersonal networks that reproduce themselves over time. I'm a strong believer that um, you know, violence is one of the major uh, impulsores, drivers or uh, uh, of migration, uh, but that it's also the, the, the inability of the state to uh, respond appropriately uh, through all of its institutions to the reality of violence. It has to respond appropriately in terms of justice, it has to respond appropriately in terms of education and, and options to those who are experiencing violence. We know more and more about the issues of trauma and violence, even trauma in children and how that reproduces itself over time. Uh, so it's not only an issue of violence, but it's the failure of a state and a society to respond appropriately to the phenomenon of violence in a very nuanced way. Traditionally, 
the United States, as we know, but increasingly people in Latin America and Central America, unfortunately, have responded to violence only through incarceration. And oftentimes incarceration is what exacerbates the phenomenon of violence. People are put in jail, uh, are, are left there with little hope, and they uh, become uh, violent because it's the only way they can survive. They have to join criminal gangs. They have to join others. Uh, and so when they come out of prison, incarceration, they have a whole different framework and ability and, and, and willingness to think. So what we argue for in this piece is a new approach to the issue of violence, a new approach to the issue of drugs and illicit drugs, and a new approach to how we think about the role of government in society to deal with these phenomenon of uh, chronic uh, violence. Um, so I think that's uh, kind of in response to your question and I'm glad to take other questions as well. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, uh, we move on to our last panelist, Jessica. Okay, so welcome. So my question for you is, from anti-immigrant sentiment infused into the political conversation to Spanish language disinformation spreading doubt about the US election result among the immigrant communities, your focus is it's on the intersection of social media and the Latin and Latino community. Okay, so I said two part question, right? So who is responsible in your opinion for creating such campaigns of deception? And then uh, we know now that Facebook and other social media outlets were and still are the main conduit for spreading the, the misinformation. So what role do you believe the federal government should play in regulating? Hi everyone, good morning and uh, thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be uh, around great panelists such as yourselves. Um, so in the lead up to the 2020 presidential election, Latinx people in the United States were flooded with disinformation, which continued long after election day and it has even transcended to disinformation around COVID and vaccines. Uh, up to this day. But prior to the election last year, CAP tracked several language disinformation posts and pages and was constantly sharing those with the Facebook staff. However, even after several email exchanges, the posts and content with glaring uh, claims of voter fraud and um, COVID vaccine disinformation were still up on Facebook spreading by the by huge numbers. Um, in November of 2020, um, CAP, Free Press, and the National Hispanic Media Coalition sent a letter to Mark Zuckerberg expressing a deep disappointment in Facebook's inaction and enable, it, enabling of targeting manipulation and disenfranchisement of the Latinx um, Com community in regard to the election. Other coalition members that signed on to the letter were Media Justice, um, the Global Project Against Hate and Extremism, LULAC, Mi Familia Vota, uh, the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, Voto Latino, as well as many others. Um, we then in March uh, of 2021, launched the campaign hashtag Javasta Facebook or hashtag it's enough Facebook during a press call with Congress member Cardenas where we unveiled the Spanish language disinformation action plan which is a plan that describes immediate steps for Facebook to take to address Spanish language disinformation. Um, one of the recommendations is hiring and publicly identifying an executive level position to oversee U.S. Spanish language content moderation and, uh, and policy enforcement, since we have not yet known who is in charge of 
content moderation in US Spanish content. Uh, secondly, to publicly explain the translation process of the content algorithm, including how the algorithm is trained and audited to ensure a proactive det detection and processing of Spanish language content. Third, to clarify whether Facebook's content mo moderators evaluate content in language, translated, or both, to explain precisely how many US-based Spanish language content moderators the company employs, as well as the overall number of US-based content moderators. And lastly, to publicly share the materials that are used to train content moderators of US-based Spanish language content. We've also worked with members of Congress, uh, like I mentioned, um, Rep. Cardenas, as well as Congresswoman um, Chikowski, to raise the issue during the um, Energy and Commerce Committee hearing that happened on March of 20, 25th of this year, um, to ask directly to Mark Zuckerberg about what he's doing in order to better moderate the disinformation happening in Spanish. Of course, we, we've heard very vague answers and which is why we're continuing our campaign, especially right now, as we know that a lot of disinformation is spreading on social media about vaccines and the, their effectiveness and how, how much that actually is impacting um, Spanish speakers on Facebook and across other social media platforms. I'm happy to answer any questions about what our work. Thank you, Jessica. I do have a quick follow-up question for you. So now, uh, as I ask Jessica and she answers the question, again, I want to invite the participants to post your questions and we will invite you to ask your questions to the panelists, okay? Uh, so Jessica, um, a quick follow-up. So how do you think that the misinformation affects immigrant sentiments, whether be it about a political system or even the general public uh, sentiments of immigrants? Yeah, it, it affects enormously. Um, I mean, the, the Latino community uses social media platforms a, a lot. That's, you know, that's how we communicate through Facebook. My, my grandma has a Facebook. Um, uh, a lot of our familias have WhatsApp, you know? So a lot of the information that people see there, they don't know that it might be false, right? They, they might be, um, they, they might think that just everything that is there is correct, um, which is why we, we have driven so much for this content to be removed um, instead of just labeled. Because if there's a label in, in a false claim that the election um, was, for example, a, a, a fraud, um, people might just you know, click to, to take that label off. Um, they might not have the time to read it or not care. Um, so that's, that, that was a big glaring issue that we, we're, that we're still trying to, to discuss with, with Facebook, how, you know, if it's glaring disinformation and glaring false information about vaccines, you know, labels are not going to be enough. We need that content to be taken down immediately. Um, we have shared, um, which I wrote on my latest op-ed, we have shared uh, to Facebook concerns about call, calls to arms. Um, of violence that that happened last year before the Kenosha sh shootings, when Facebook decided to do a huge sweep of of, of all the call, calls to arms after the Kenosha shooting, th this post in Spanish call, calling for arms was still up. So there's there's something going on with um, the the fact that. Spanish is not being moderated at the same ac accuracy and level as, as English. And that has real life consequences. That, that's what we, we have always tried to, to share with them. It's, it has 
there's safety concerns involved with violence, there's health concerns involved when our communities are not trusting the vaccines. Um, so I'll stop there um, because I'm sure that there's more questions for the rest of our panelists. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Robert posted a question earlier and I am going to invite him to ask this question. But before he, I, I do that, I do have a follow up question uh, for Eric and possibly for President Solis. Okay, so in the criminology field, we know that um, one of the risk factor of people getting involved in crime, um, especially crimes of violence related to drugs, trafficking and, and illicit drug market is lack of legitimate opportunities, right? Um, so I want to ask you, what do you think other countries in the Americas can actually pursue or implement in order to tackle the, the lack of legitimate opportunities in their country? Well, I'm happy to defer to President Solis Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Eric and Rosa. I think that's a very key question. There's always a lot of a lack of information regarding these issues. And, but one of the some of the factors that I find repeated through the literature and in my own experience as a policymaker, is that you have a, a combination of factors such as unemployment of young men, access to small weapons, and urban underdevelopment, uh, you know, cities that are ill uh, planned that have no no uh, enough recreation facilities that are uh, dark even that they have no light and therefore they have vacant spaces where criminals criminals may abide at night and, and do their business things can get pretty bad uh, and i say men because men are generally the victims and perpetrators of most crimes related to drugs women are not as uh, as present in the, in the statistics so um, finding a way to uh, address the issue of ur ur urban planning, for example, um, ensuring that there is an access to, to jobs, not necessarily well paid, but at least decently paid jobs, uh, and definitely controlling weapons, especially small weapons, is something that we need to, to consider. Uh, and, and, and the three things have to be uh, pursued together. It's not one or the other, but the three of them together. Now, we are talking here of different levels, of course, of violence, as, as Eric has already um, uh, mentioned. Um, and there's petty, petty distribution of drugs, for example, that happens in the barrios, in the neighborhoods. And then you have the international and transnational crime rings. And each of the levels have different complications and complexities in terms of controlling violence. Uh, sometimes the, the local um, cir circumstance is even more violent than the transnational one, you know, because of the feud between different groups of, of gangs and the turfs, the turf battles that, that they, they, they perform. So in ensuring that one can um, provide those uh, mechanisms of of, uh, uh, of distension, uh, looking ways in which one can uh, take away the detonance of, of violence is very important. I remember a few years back, uh, I was in Guatemala, and a a person relate, re related to to communities work that who worked in communities told me that one of the most interesting things she had seen was the. Uh, uh, experiment that was made under President Colomb's uh, administration, who decided to take the National Symphony Orchestra to the to some of these very violent barrios, and that it was astonishing how, during a brief period of time, crime came down to zero. Simply not only because the the perpetrators were attending the concerts, but bec but because there was a, a a sense of community of you know, a small expansion of, of, of certain kind of dignity and pride that was associated to the fact that this marvelous orchestra, orchestra was playing there. So, you know, things such as painting the houses, putting uh, light bulbs on, on, on fields of different sports, um, creating, creating spaces that are secure so that young, young people can go there at night 
to do sports or recreational activities of different area, uh, different types, including theater and reading poetry, uh, having the possibility of bringing more women, in, more women into these activities, not only boys, but also girls that can partake, I think are all possibilities that can reduce violence significantly. Although as uh, Eric also uh, mentioned, there are instances where it is impossible not to respond to violence with legitimate violence exercised uh, according to the law by the local authorities, because uh, simply you cannot simply uh, discard the use, the legitimate use of force as an instrument that sometimes results um, in uh, unavoidable uh, to control violence. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I agree, I, I also remember, I was already not in Venezuela, but I remember that they implemented a similar program where the symphony orchestra that they went to the, uh, remember that, Eric? I, Eric, you might remember that. Okay, so, uh, so thank you again. And now I'm gonna invite Robert to ask his question. And please, Robert. First of all, good morning and thank you so much. Uh, for being here and for giving your thoughts and your insights and findings. Uh, it's a great honor to be in your presence. I wanted to ask what your thoughts were on the effectiveness of regional PACs, um, including those led by the United States in addressing issues of immigration and migration. You want to direct it to somebody? <laughs> sure, I will direct it to President Solis. Well, Eric deferred to me the first question, so I defer to him <laughs> this one. <laughs> Go ahead, my friend. Okay, well, I mean, I, I think it's really important that the phenomenon of migration be uh, understood uh, in its regional context. I think I think uh, you know. I don't. I don't want to make an overly political statement, but I think the last administration in the United States viewed it as a problem of borders and border control. And I think those of us who have thought about migration and understand the historic elements of migration ought to recognize that it's a pretty complex series of factors: the the pull factors and push factors to to oversimplify. Um, and I do think there's a reason to want to understand what's happening, uh, especially in Central America, Mexico, and the United States in a regional context. As President Solis rightly pointed out, uh, the countries of Central America have a great responsibility here. It's not all on the United States. Obviously, US has a big, uh, you know, is a huge labor market. Uh, we're desperate for workers now, and there's going to be a, some pull from family unification. But we can think about these things together, come up with um, uh, strategies and policies uh, that people uh, can share. Um, I don't want to be Pollyannish about it and, and think that just simply having a regional accord will make it all magically go away. That's not, it's not simplistic like that. But I do think there are ways in which we should sit down as partners uh, and include in that discussion, frankly, uh, civil society organizations who are providing services, are providing uh, uh, alternatives and safety to uh, migrants to hear from the migrants themselves about what their needs are. Uh, that would be a better frame than thinking that we'll, we'll deal with this simply by uh, enforcing greater border controls. I'm all for border management, very good management, but not the notion that you can control migration simply by reinforcing the border. Thank you so much. Okay. If, I may, if I may, Robert, uh, can I just, uh add to what Eric has mentioned, um, that there is very, there's insufficient normative or legal normative regarding migrations in the international uh, field. I mean, we have some significant uh, 
numbers of laws and, 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 and regional and, and world treaties on refugees, for example. But migrants are a different thing. There's virtually nothing there. Even in, within the United Nations, you know, what they have is, is very, very um, feeble. So one uh, significant and most important part of the, of the discussion in creating regional networks and working through multilateral organizations would be to create these protocols uh, so that migrants can be protected and somehow uh, get, gain the status that they don't have at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question, our, our next question. I think I'm gonna jump a little bit so Jessica can answer this question. This question is from Nicole, Nicole Regalado. If I, I can invite you to turn on your video and ask your question. If you feel shy about turning on your video, if you unmute yourself and ask Jessica your question. Hi, yes, I'll unmute. My monitor doesn't have the camera at the moment, but um, hi, panelists. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been very informative. I wanted to ask about disinformation through WhatsApp. Um, I did like a research paper on it and I found that it's not just Facebook, but through WhatsApp, since it's through family and friends, they assume that the information being shared is accurate and they trust it. And the gap between the actual news that produces this and publishes this and then how it gets to them through messages like it's it's hard to find who actually published that information if it's been altered or not and I just want to know if there's programs to kind of address it specifically in WhatsApp. Hi Nicole thanks for asking that wonderful question and uh, that sounds like an exciting paper. Um, so yes there's a lot of disinformation happening on WhatsApp as well, um, I would say it's happening almost at the same rate as Facebook. Um, and it's also happening across other platforms, right? Uh, on YouTube as, as, as well. Um, I'll say that we started this, our campaign started with Facebook um, because we started compiling a list of disinformation um, that we started sharing with with Facebook that they that they hadn't caught. Um, with Facebook, it is a little bit challenged, or with WhatsApp, it's a little bit challenging, as you may have noticed, because it's all in private groups. Um, so we we have to be a little bit more creative with how to start to start pulling that data from what WhatsApp if if we're not actually invited to to a group. Um, but that's definitely WhatsApp is definitely a platform that we're thinking about as, as well. Um, and I'll even say that disinformation is happening even within other languages that are, that are here in the US and that are not Spanish, right? Like um, in a lot of Asian languages, for example. We, there, we, ever since we launched this, this campaign, we've been, we've, I've heard from other, other groups trying to, to learn how to combat disinformation in Vietnamese um and in, in in other platforms so we're just starting um but we are definitely looking to to have a wider scope um and yes i think that we we definitely need you know need to continue to also work with with congress um especially as as we've seen a lot of um, disinformation in regards to, to vaccines in, in, in the present time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we have one more, uh, one more question. And if anybody else have uh, any more questions, please, again, uh, feel free to post them. I have here a question from Nita. And she apparently, it's in my class. Sorry, Nita, I didn't recognize your name. Uh, so Nita, I'm gonna invite you to do the same. Please ask your question um, by unmuting yourself and turning on your, your uh, video camera. If you don't wanna turn on your video camera, you can just unmute and ask your question. Oh, that's fine. Thank you, uh, Professor Chang. So the question I wanted to ask, um, what do you believe should be the best standard for the United States to deal with um, with the migration policies, considering what's going on with the pandemic, the economy, how it's changed so much, 
and the different immigration regulations and patterns across different countries. Well, I don't, I don't know what the, uh, I don't know the inst international instruments well enough, maybe the president, Mr. President, uh, so these does. I, I know that the fundamental and most important one generally is protection. Uh, the rights of people to move and be protected. Um, and, you know, I think that's one of the, one of the ways in which the Biden administration is trying to address uh, this uh, current surge, this current crisis, if you want to call it that. First, by finding and defining more ways to legally migrate, um, because those have been so reduced over the years that people give up hope of any kind of legal migration and head out uh, in an irregular fashion, which then exposes them to great, a great deal of threat and violence, abuse, et cetera. So expanding legal migration has gotta be a starting point for all of this. Uh, doesn't mean open borders. Uh, I think we need to be clear about that. But as I said before, you know, there's a difference between border control and border management and border management and immigration management, uh, especially in a multilateral way, has got to be at the core of this. Expanding legal migration and then uh, international uh, treaties and conventions provide for a process of seeking asylum, seeking protection when you are being prosecuted, persecuted, excuse me, under five definitions of the law. And again, I think in the last US administration, there was a real attempt to close down those, um, those options uh, and redefine them in a way that is much more narrow and puts people's rights to protection uh, at risk. So I think the current administration is trying again to redefine that. I've participated in some of those calls and I don't know that they have defined a new policy quite yet on that front, but that's very much at the core of what they're doing. And then I think as we've alluded to already, uh, we all wanna find uh, ways in which people can remain in their countries. And I don't mean that to suggest, you know, again, border controls, you have to stay, don't come, but to give people an opportunity, find ways to remain. Uh, you know, uh, I think as harsh as conditions are in parts of Central America, uh, people on balance would prefer to stay home, stay in their neighborhoods, stay in their social networks, if that were a viable option. And so I think that's very much a part of a responsibility, not maybe in the international treaties and covenants around migration and refugees, but certainly a responsibility of every good democratic governance to find alternatives to migration before people have to put their lives at risk to seek the kind of protection that, that you would expect. Obviously, and you referred to the COVID-19, I think that's been a very uh, challenging uh, uh, situation for all the governments. Uh, one, on the one hand is the concern about spreading pandemic and healthcare and in other countries. On the other hand, people are, are fleeing because they're desperate and can't find access to uh, the kind of healthcare that they need. Uh, I can't tell you the number of uh, good friends from Central America who have shown up in the United States for mysteriously for a three week period uh, and they're here in large part to get you know vaccinated. I'm not critical of that. I think that's great that they're getting vaccinated, but so many people in Central America don't have that ability and become desperate uh, when they don't have access to the basic health care that they need. Many times that health care is absent because of longstanding corruption and practices of corruption. So uh, these all these issues are intertwined and have to be understood as in, its, in their totality. I don't know if that answers your question, but just a few thoughts to, to chew on. I, I would also like to add uh, to Nira's question because I think it's central. I, I, I agree uh, entirely with Eric regarding protection. 
I think that's a, a fundamental status that we need to ensure, particularly because, again, of the criminal relationship with, with, uh, with migration. I mean, the human trafficking. In Spanish, we, we differentiate between human trafficking and what we called uh, human uh, uh, trata, trata y tráfico, which are two different concepts. In the United States, you only use trafficking. But regarding this, I, I would say that there's also something that complicates situ the situation, and that's the different impact that migration has on women, men, and children. The needs are different, but the protection needs to go to all. <clears throat> but providing that protection uh, in signifies that you have to attend to different kinds of responsibilities. For example, this is particularly serious with children because you have to ensure that the adults they're traveling with are indeed their parents. And this is not the case all the time. So having to deal with this complexities, which in some sometimes uh, requires a lot of resources and time, which is something that generally one doesn't have when dealing with massive flows of of individuals is central. But I, I do think that protecting people, respecting them, treating them decently, not accusing them of being rapists and thieves, uh, ensuring that there is a public policy that attends to their needs is central to the, to the issue. Thank you. Um, so we have one last question, Eric, we have time for one last question. Yeah, perfect timing for you. Yeah, perfect timing. I, I think so too. So this question is from Gerald. If I'm going to invite you to ask your question, please. Uh, absolutely, Dr. Chen. So my question really regards, um, you know, we've seen a we've seen a very big social media campaign from the Biden administration to put ads up deterring illegal immigration. Um, we've seen we've seen that research shows that smugglers and friends and families and people that it's just words about, it's traveling much faster than any official statement that the U.S. can put out. So what can we do to be able to help these people that want to immigrate to the United States not get it taken advantage of by smugglers on the way that are lying to them, to, you know, promising them a better future when they're really going to be just abused on the way over here? Thank you. Well, I only have a couple minutes, so maybe I'll just spout off a couple seconds here and, and turn it over to the rest of you. Um, you know, I, in some ways, uh, you know, you can't, uh, in terms of time, uh, beat the bad publicity of the so-called uh, uh, coyotes. Um, they will spin everything in their direction. But I think we, you know, I think what we need to do, what I see the Biden administration do, is trying to put in place a long-term strategy here around the issues that, that we mentioned just a minute ago around protection and legal migration that aren't going to be resolved tomorrow, but that are part of a long-term strategy and a long-term solution. Also around the issue of uh, addressing the drivers of migration in Central America, uh, again, those things aren't going to turn around in, in two months, three months, four months. It's long term. But if we continue to deal with the series of what I call crises uh, on a short term basis, I think we just, we, you know, we just continue to re-experience uh, these problems and drama every so often. Ricardo Suniga, who was the special envoy, and I wrote a book last year when he was on leave from the State Department that tried to look at the experience from 2014 to 2019 to understand what we did right, what we did wrong, and how we can put in place a longer term strategy. We make a, month, a whole number of recommendations. These recommendations aren't going to change the dynamic of a coyote telling people, you gotta go now, you gotta go now. But if we don't address those long-term uh, dynamics, we just continue to spin our wheels. And that's the, tr that's the trap that I think we need to get out, get out of. I think that's what the administration is trying to do. I hope they're successful, uh, but that's, that's the real challenge that, that we face. Jessica, you go ahead, please have the final word. Oh, um... I think, yeah, just 
when it comes to any disinformation, the Latinx community, I was just going to add about the new Voto Latino and Media Matters um, disinformation lab that that is helping to combat a lot of the disinformation in the Latinx com communities. And as I shared, we're directly targeting Facebook on that. Um, so that's all I'll share. Um, and I'll give the last word to, uh, to Mr. Solis. No, thank you. I, 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 I concur. I, I think that uh, you are not going to beat the legal, the legal networks. Uh, so you have to just add as many efforts possible to, to uh, defeat them. They have the, the capacity and they have the networks on, on their favor. You know, people believe things. Uh, but one thing is important, and this is the last idea. If they are to choose between staying in let's say, again, decent conditions in their country, or leaving and risking everything in the, in the voyage to a destination that where, the, where, the, where the, uh, uh, their lives are not insured by any means, I think most people would remain in their countries. It's, it's a question of, of you know, framing the conditions in the right way. And with that, I will uh, draw to a close a insightful hour of engagement among our students, our faculty experts, and our DC-based uh, policy colleagues. Thank you so much, uh, President Solis, Dr. Chang for moderating, Jessica and Eric for uh, being here today. I have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.